<laughs> I'm Nick Diaz, and I'm honored to serve as the student government president on the Pleasantville campus. I extend a warm welcome to each of you as we gather together for President's Krizlov State of the University 2024. I navigated the tumultuous pandemic years as a high school student, and March this March 2024 or March four years since that faithful moment in seventh period when we were informed of a two week shutdown only for it to extend to two years. The shift from bustling in-person classes with familiar faces to the remote landscape of virtual learning via Zoom was a challenge I never thought I'd had to face. But now as a sophomore in college, I'm excited about the vibrant present. I've experienced some of the most extraordinary moments of my life here at Pace and I'm forever thankful. The indelible moments and memories crafted during this period are destined to internally reside within the, my heart forever. It seems just like yesterday, I was apprehensive and scared about stepping into the realm of higher education, but yet today, I stand before all of you remarkable individuals and I attribute my growth and my achievements to the unparalleled support of Pace University. This incredible community has been the cornerstone of my success, granting me opportunities that I once deemed beyond my reach. I'm pro profoundly grateful for the experiences, the friendships, and the lessons that have enriched my college experience. And I look forward to the continued journey ahead with boundless appreciation for the transformative impact of this exceptional community. Pace University is thriving, and I feel fortunate enough to witness its growth, whether it's active student engagement, academic excellence, or the overall enriching of student life, there's truly no place like Pace. I'm delighted to be part of the university's current success and eagerly anticipate its future even beyond my graduation. And I'm eager to join with you all today to hear President Krizlov present his vision for our future. So without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome President Krizlov to the stage. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> that was one kind introduction and you started us off on such a wonderful note. Um, so colleagues, students, friends, hello from the Kessel Student Center on our Pleasantville campus. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today, whether you're here in person or joining remotely. This afternoon, I'm gonna talk about where we are at Pace University and where we're going as we move the university forward. After my remarks, we'll take questions from those in the room and also those watching on Zoom. I wanna to start today by saying how happy I am to see so many of you here and so many joining us remotely as well. I'm happy about, as Nick said, the resurgent spirit on our campuses. I'm so proud of all we have accomplished together and I'm excited for where we are going. The last several years have been tough. We managed through the pandemic, we managed the return to campus, we were resilient, we adapted, and we did what PACE people always do. We were creative and resourceful, and we succeeded. Last year in this speech, I introduced our new normal. It was the time when we got back to something resembling a normal life, if a differently normal life. But this year, I think, is the time when we are finally getting our optimism and our energy back what our former board chair, Mark Beska, used to call our pace swagger. When I walk around our campuses, I'm seeing that swagger again. I see bustling offices. I see in-person teaching and learning, and I'm doing that myself. I see packed libraries, hardworking study groups, and students laughing in busy dining halls. When I talk to our students, I feel that energy, that excitement, and that sense of possibility. Our students, have turned the corner. We're also seeing this new outlook in all the amazing things happening across PACE. Since last year's State of the University Address, the women's lacrosse team here in Pleasantville has become not only PACE University's first national championship team, but the first ever national champions in Westchester County. Mark Brown just told me that today is our first game in the new season on our defense of our national championship. In New York City, we opened our new campus center at 15 Beekman. 
It offers brand new classrooms and common areas, a modern residence hall, a great library, a state-of-the-art new home for the Seidenberg School of Computer Science and Information Systems. And at Haub Law, our environmental law program was ranked number one in the country for the third consecutive year. Our trial advocacy team last month took home a national championship, and we are deepening our commitment to serving our community through our clinics and our access to justice initiatives. We launched a new college, the New Sands College of Performing Arts, recognizing a transformational gift from our board chair, Rob Sands, and his wife, Pamela. Faculty in Dyson College won major new grants to support experiential education in the humanities. Our recently developed online degree programs in Lubin were ranked among the best in the country, both undergrad and MBA. The School of Education is developing an online doctorate in education, that school's first doctoral degree. And at the College of Health Professions, we're continue, continuing to see impressive pass rates on licensure exams, posting record enrollment in some programs, and we're hard at work on a new doctoral degree in the Le Leanhardt School of Nursing. And the Seidenberg School is preparing a new artificial intelligence lab, which will serve as the AI hub for our entire university, providing opportunities for learning, training, interdisciplinary collaboration, and grant-funded research. At PACE today, we are firing on all cylinders. But as well as things are going at PACE, we must also recognize that today we are, as a nation, in a challenging moment for higher education. Students and parents are questioning the value of college. Global pressures are creating new tensions on campuses. The pandemic led to learning loss and mental distress among students. We are still managing the implications of that. But the extraordinary thing is that here at PACE, we are demonstrating that a diverse community can work together productively in an environment of mutual respect. And when that is done right, higher education can continue to be the engine of success and mobility it has always been in this country. We are proving these things by doing exactly what we've done for nearly 120 years. We seek out motivated, hardworking students. We recruit our faculty and staff committed to teaching and learning and to helping our students succeed. We offer powerful hands-on education that's grounded in the liberal arts and we deliver. Pace University has always believed in experiential education, in learning by doing. Our students have always been part of the world, not isolated in some ivory tower. Today, we call that model the PACE path. And we're seeing in this challenging moment is that the PACE path works. People want to know that college is worth that investment. They want to know that their students will graduate with useful practical schools. They want to know that their college graduates will know how to work together, how to innovate, how to get ahead. This is exactly what we do. And that's exactly why the PACE path works. Across higher ed, we know that a college degree can transform a life. It can deliver higher earnings, upward mobility, better health outcomes, but what we do at PACE exceeds what other colleges accomplish. Just look at our placement numbers. Data for the class of 23 aren't final, but we know the results for class of 22 were stellar. 94% of our bachelor's graduates are employed or continuing their education six months after graduation. A whopping 97% of master's graduates are our employment rates are at least 10 points above national averages as they have been year after year. These outcomes prove that we deliver value and they are thanks to the hard work of so many, the students who have such drive, the faculty who impart their knowledge and expertise, the staff who ensure our students have the resources they need. These outcomes are thanks to you and to your dedication 
and your commitment. In this speech over the last few years, I focused on critical nuts and bolts matters. Today, I wanna to talk about the most important asset we have at PACE. I want to focus on our commitment to supporting the people, the people of PACE University. Let me start with our remarkable students. What I always say is true. Everything we do at PACE really is in service to our students. Today, we know that our students need even more from us. That's why we've expanded our learning common sense academic support services. Students have access to tutors and other resources to help them with coursework in writing, math, science, business, computer programming, and, and other fields. In fall of 23, nearly 1,800 students benefited from Learning Commons resources, a substantial increase from a year earlier. We are also plotting other course and program-based learning supports. All UNV students within Seidenberg have academic skills workshops. We're embedding tutors in chemistry and nursing sections. And the Learning Commons offered writing to support to over 160 graduate students during the fall semester. We are also augmenting the first year experience to ensure that all students get off to a great start, including by adding new advisors. And we are redoubling our efforts to build out, differentiate and promote our experiential education. Not because it's just our hair, not be just because it's our heritage and our formula, but because it's because we know that students who participate in these activities, who participate in hands-on learning, are more engaged, perform better, and are more likely to retain and graduate. Experiential education includes academic research and on-the-ground fieldwork. It includes time spent in classrooms and clinical settings, externships and sim simulation labs, it includes academic competition, civic engagement, and creative expression. It's seen in the art gallery, the Blue Collab, the Design Lab, the Entrepreneurship Lab, the New Pace Entrepreneurship Studio. And of course, internships are also experiential education. In two weeks, you are invited to what I am very excited about, a provocative panel on our New York City campus it will consider the future of the humanities, featuring the president of the New York City Public Library and the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We will highlight the experiential humanities we are doing at Pace University. It's clear that this type of learning is happening all across our university. It is helping our students succeed, and we want to make sure that it is all recognized and supported. We are also committed to making sure that our students have the mental health support they need. I've always said that it's crucial for students, many of whom are living on their own for the first time, to learn time management and to prioritize their self-care by eating well, sleeping enough, and exercising. Mental health needs today are even greater. This is true nationwide, and it's true at pace. Our New York City Counseling Center, for example, has seen a 154% increase, yes, you heard me right, in walk-in visits in the past year. Over the last few years, we've launched the full scope of our wellness programming, led by our Center for Wellbeing. We're making university-wide efforts to combat food insecurity. We're offering many grants for new proposals to, pro to boost well-being. And we've partnered with outside organizations that help to support our community members, to name just a few of our efforts. An important collaboration is our work with Radical Health, which offers training to help students build, build resilience. Over the last two years, more than 400 students have completed that training. All this is in addition to the ongoing work of PACE units like the Counseling Center, the Division of Student Affairs. And starting this year, we are offering training to all PACE community members on all three campuses in mental health first aid, so that we are sure that people in our community stand ready to offer the help needed. We are prioritizing frontline student-facing staff, and already more than 100 staffers have earned certificates. We know these efforts 
are working. This fall, we saw our first second first to second year retention rate rise to 76.7%. That's a big increase from a year earlier, 5.5% in, percentage increase. It's the highest retention rate we've reached since before the pandemic. It's a great accomplishment. We know we need to do more. We will need to maintain that same year over year progress to reach our goal of an 85% retention rate in 2028. And our work on graduation rates will require even more effort. Before the pandemic, we had made real progress. Then the pandemic set us back. For the most recent cohort, we achieved a six-year graduation rate of 61.3%, which was in line with the prior year. But over the next several years, as classes affected by the pandemic complete their college years, that rate is likely to come under pressure. Our target is a 70% six-year graduation rate. The work we are doing now to improve retention will in time get us there. And we're also making real efforts to bring back students who stopped out during the pandemic. It will take all of these efforts and all of our commitment to get graduation rates to where they need to be. I also want to make it clear that our, we are equally focused on delivering for the people who work at Pace University. We have always worked to be an employer of choice. We offer generous benefits. We provide opportunities for professional development and career growth. We know how important it is to support our faculty and staff. Let me share a few facts and figures. In the last two budget years, we have invested $66 million in our operations, separate from capital. A large portion was spent on student success initiatives, including some of the efforts I just outlined, new programming and financial aid. About half was spent on faculty and staff. After 75 faculty searches in the last two years, we now have the largest full-time faculty since the fall of 2019. And the average staff salary has increased from $63,000 in 1819 to $83,000 today. We know we always need to do more. We know well-being is a challenge for employees. The Center for Well-Being has partnered with human resources to offer wellness programming for faculty and staff. HR, and Neil is here today, also offers a range of regular programming to improve employee mental health and well being. And all PACE employees have access to the Aetna Resources for Living program, which offers both resources for health and wellness and 24 7 access for immediate support and referrals. The PACE Works project will simplify and optimize many student administrative processes. And it's helping to improve our work here by making processes more efficient, digitizing road, road tasks, and freeing up staff members to spend more time on more engaging, fulfilling responsibilities. Next month, we will be launching a new Great Lakes, new Great Colleges to Workforce survey to see how you think we've moved forward since the last survey two years ago and to gain insights into our priorities for the future. Based on what we learned from the last survey, we've been working to improve communication, including from senior leaders. We've overhauled the onboarding process and we're focused on rebuilding in-person opportunities for employee engagement, development, and recognition. Employee Development Day will be back in person in New York and Pleasantville next month. We also got great feedback on our reimagined recognition events last year. This year, you should see that in the, the ceremonies that are coming up in April. We're also committed to supporting faculty in their academic ambitions. Professor Sonia Suchte is our new interim university director of sponsored research, and she will help our scholars build strong applications that will yield impressive grants. Dyson faculty recently won a combined $350,000 in new National Endowment for Humanities grants to support experiential education at PACE. Earlier in the year, Seidenberg professor 
Zhang Zhang won a $500,000 grant from the National Science Foundation for his work on wearable technologies. Countless other faculty are winning new and continuing competitive grants and making real contributions to their field. We are working hard to help these faculty achieve their successes. We are also working to expand international opportunities for faculty and staff. We have developed an international expertise inventory where we identify those with region specific expertise and connections and then make it easier for others to connect with them. And PACE International is actively monitoring funding opportunities that can help support those international ambitions. And yes, we do know that compensation matters too. It's no secret that our budgets here are tight and our resources are limited, but we also know that we need to be competitive and our employees need to feel valued. We have been committed to salary increases each year. We have also maintained excellent and affordable health coverage. Right now, HR is working in partnership with Gallagher Consulting on a major project for salary classification and peer benchmarking. We expect to receive recommendations this summer on staffing levels and structure, spans of control and salaries. And we look forward to sharing them with the community soon thereafter. This study will be an invaluable tool in ensuring that we can continue to attract and retain top talent. We also know that adjunct faculty are an important part of our community, and we are eager to sit down with the adjunct union leadership to start negotiations on the new contract. We are all on the same team, and we want to do right by the people who work here. Now, let me step back and offer a broader perspective on the next few years in higher education in America. What we do at PACE happens within the context of the wider world. We are living in a difficult and challenging time. Politics have become both deeply polarized and all-encompassing, which to many can feel like a real emotional burden. While the economy is thriving, housing costs keep accelerated, accelerating and heightened interest rates are driving up the cost of living for many. Devastating global conflicts in Ukraine, in Israel and Gaza and elsewhere add to our distress and for some of us pose life and death risks for friends and loved ones. That's why we are investing so much in our new suite of wellness programs for everyone. That's why our student affairs team is working so hard to engage all students. This is when the proud and vibrant diversity at PACE becomes such a great asset. We are working hard to provide all the financial aid we can for our students. Our alumni and donors are stepping up to fund more and more scholarships. And I wanna thank and commend the development team for reaching lofty new targets. We are also making real progress on our DEI initiatives. In the summer of 2020, we made the commitment that PACE would become an inclusive anti-racist institution. Since then, we've inaugurated important efforts from Social Justice Week each fall to the addition of anti-racism education courses to the core curriculum. This year, I'm pleased that, to say that we're launching the work of our Barry M. and Jackie Gosson Center for Equity and Inclusion, focusing on four key areas. The Gosson Center's signature events will kick off this semester as we begin a, a series of talks, conferences, and fireside chats. Next week, for example, the center will host Elizabeth Nieto, Global Health uh, Head of Equity and Impact at Spotify. The center will also inaugurate fellowships for junior faculty and emerging scholars. It will start a small group program for staff members to work together. And it will launch the new Gossen Network here in Pleasantville, which will award retention scholarships to students who participate in designated courses or activities. This work will make PACE a better community for all of us. We must almost also remember that this remains a difficult time for 
for higher education as a sector. Costs continue to rise, but tuition simply cannot rise at the same rate. As American birth rates decline and demographics shift, there are fewer students of traditional college age in this country, and particularly in the Northeast. We have known some time about, for some time about these challenges, and we are prepared for them, but that doesn't make them less challenging. We set a goal to shift our enrollment mix to make our revenue less dependent on undergraduate enrollment. We are now at record setting graduate enrollment. We set a goal to attract more international enrollment. That's paying off as we're building new partnerships with universities in India, maintaining our pathways with China, and expanding our connections to other geographies where there may we believe there is demand for high quality English language education, including places like Mexico and Egypt. We set a goal to attract more continuing and online learners. We're doing that. We're doing that by launching new programs, building new collaborations, and offering shorter and more accessible certificates and badges, which will allow adult learners to refresh and gain the skills they need without committing to a full degree program. In other words, at Pace University, we are ready for what's coming. That doesn't mean we're on a glide path. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy. It does mean that we will need to be careful and responsible. It means we'll have to keep those belts tight and our eyes on the ball. But it means we're gonna be able to keep doing what we've been doing for nearly 120 years, providing access to the transformative power of high, higher education to hardworking, ambitious students, regardless of their backgrounds. In fact, these next few years will require us to do exactly what we teach our students to do. We will need to be smart and strategic, ambitious and creative. We will need to work hard. And just like our students and graduates, we are ready to do that work and take advantage of those opportunities. As an institution, this is our opportunitas moment. We need to remain competitive so that our students want to come to PACE and be a part of this really special community. That's why we're working hard to even further build out and differentiate experiential education offerings. We know that is something valuable, something we do well, something that makes us stand out. That's why we're investing in facilities across our campuses, whether that's the new buildings in New York, the new cyber range in Pleasantville, the new security improvements for Hub Law. We need to offer students the spaces and resources that make clear our commitment to supporting them and make the prospective students wanna be here, wanna be on our campuses. That's why we are pushing so hard for program innovation, to make sure we are offering students the educational opportunities they want and need to succeed in today's economy. That program innovation doesn't always mean that we're creating new programs. As Professor Kelly Kreitz and others have talked about, we are bucking national trends toward decreased humanities enrollment by structuring our humanities programs to give students the practical hands-on education they seek. While English majors nationwide are decreasing, for example, ours are growing because we offer innovative, experiential courses that excite our students and prepare them for careers. At the same time, it's also why we're adding new curricular offerings and new extracurriculars, like Seidenberg's new BS in video game design and our wildly successful Pace Esports teams. These things keep us current, keep us competitive. But the best thing, the best thing that we can do to ensure that PACE continues to thrive, and I wanna be very clear about this, is to improve our retention and graduation rates. So much of what we're doing serves those goals. Student success must be, and must continue to be, our North Star. Making sure that our students stay on track 
toward their educational goals and graduate on time is at its most basic, the right thing to do. Students come to PACE to learn, to earn a degree, and we owe it to them to do everything we can to help them achieve that goal. But increasing our retention and graduation rates also helps us. It helps us address so many of our concerns. Improving our graduation rate is one of the single best things we can do to improve our rankings and reputation, which will in turn make us even more attractive to students and their families. Improving graduation and retention rates is also the simplest way to improve our finances. So let me say this very clearly. Pace University 2024 is in an excellent position. The state of our university is strong. We do have some choppy waters ahead as all universities in America do, but we are ready to navigate them. Here is what I ask from all of you as we chart our course forward together. We need to collaborate internally. The real world is not divided into departments or schools and colleges. And to meet the needs of the real world, we must work together across divisions as we're already doing in fields like public health, business tech, and law and sustainability. We must engage externally with local state stakeholders and the global community. We are making some great progress on partnerships with universities across the globe, with collaborations like the New York Climate Exchange, with local and regional companies, big and small. We must become even more national and international to thrive. We must elevate our academic profile by competing aggressively for funding and placing ourselves at the forefront of the public conversation. I am gratified on how well we're doing on that front, and I'm excited to see us do even more. We must be prepared to adapt in service of our mission. We must embrace new technologies, new pedagogies, new ways of learning, and new forms of education. And we must support all of our people, the fundamental core of our greatness, as we do all this. Our work is cut out for us. We are making good progress. We are improving retention and graduation. We are building for the future. We are making PACE an even better place to work and a stronger community. We are getting better and better at delivering results for our students. So let me close today by saying thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank, for, thank you for everything you do. Thank you to our committed faculty and staff for everything you do, for the wisdom and compassion you demonstrate and for your commitment to our students and to each other. Thank you to our deans and vice presidents for your leadership. Thank you to our trustees for your vision and counsel. Thank you to Provost Joseph Franco, who is doing so much to build bridges, generate new ideas and move our university forward. Thank you to the development and alumni relations team, setting new records for giving each year. Thank you as always to our friends, our donors, and the elected leaders who support our work. And thank you to the students for your ambition, for your many accomplishments, for inspiring us in everything we do. Together, all of us, we will build a strong and powerful future for PACE. And we will make sure that every day we are always delivering on our historic mission of Opportunitas. Thank you. Now, we will move into questions. For those of you here in Kessel, please feel free to welcome to, to line up at the microphones. If you're watching on Zoom, please ask your question in the Q&A function, not the chat. And Susan Donahue is here and will read it out loud. We will rotate questions and Susan will read the Zoom question in the order they come in. 
with the names, questioners' names attached, but she will skip repeats. We'll leave it to you, Susan. We Thank should you. move to the in-person questions first. We're waiting for them to come in. Okay, online. let's do that. Let's start here in Pleasantville. Yes. Do you want to introduce yourself too? Certainly. Uh, my name is Warren Goodman. I am a student at Pace Law, class of 2025. Okay. Uh, my question regards what I see to be the largest obstacle to student mental health and well-being, as well as graduation and retention at the law school, uh, which is the policy of conditional scholarships. Uh, now, at the law school, more than 90% of students are on a conditional scholarship, uh, which requires maintaining a 3.0 GPA. But because of the competitive nature of the curves at the law school, at least one third and up to one half of students will lose their scholarship after the first year. Um, that has created an enormous barrier to mental health. It certainly was for me and for everyone in my class that I talked to. Um, given the overall trend of law schools in the country over the past 10 years, uh, moving away from conditional scholarships. Uh, it has gone down from about two thirds 10 years ago to just a third today. Uh, I ask if PACE has considered moving away from this and uh, even if that led to a reduction in the overall uh, amount that the average student got, I think the vast majority of the student body would be very much in support of that. So I would just like to know your thoughts on that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Warren, for coming here. Um, it's an excellent question. I think it's one that's worth discussion. I'm not in a position today to really um, tell you exactly where we might be in our thinking about that. I have heard this concern and I think it is important to try to help our students continue on the path to success. On the other hand, um, you know, there may be a moment when you say this isn't, this isn't working out, but um, let, us, let us think about this. And Dean Anderson's not able to be here today. I believe he may be out of the country. But that's that's a discussion that we need to have. Thank you for bringing it to to our attention. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I encourage people to put their questions in. We're still waiting. Okay. No open questions yet. If this were a classroom, I would call on people, but I <laughs> I think that's not probably the best format here. Um, oh, come on. Rebecca, come on. She's the head of public policy. <laughs> no, Rebecca doesn't want to ask a question. Does anybody want to ask a question? Ah, yay. Okay, come on up. Hi, uh, my name is RJ. I'm the residence director for Alumni Hall here, which is our first year building. Um, I know you spoke a little bit about international opportunities, um, bringing more international students to campus. Um, do you have, it's okay if you don't have any specifics, but do you have any specifics about um, efforts to help integrate international students onto the campus, how we're going to recruit them, but also retain them here? So you're thinking of international students on the Pleasantville campus or just, yes, okay less international students on this yeah. campus than we do in the city. Yes, I mean, I, I taught an international student this fall, and I know that, I for instance, <laughs> Allery and I talked about what to do during Thanksgiving and so forth, and I think that that's something that, for instance, you do, do need to take uh, pay attention to. I think international students offer a great opportunity for us to learn. I also think Westchester County is actually well situated in that there are a lot of students or a lot of families I, from many different cultures and backgrounds that we connect the students to, whether those are religious communities, cultural communities, whatever. So I think that there are ways to build students' confidence on the campus itself, but also to connect them from people uh, whose cultures or countries they may have. And, and I will say that we have had international students here. I know there are international students here. For instance, I'm very uh, was very proud of the work we did, and I don't know how many of you were involved with that in supporting our Ukrainian students over the past few years. And I know there were Ukrainian students on this campus who felt um, a real sense of dislocation and disruption. And I think we did a really good job. And I, 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 to my knowledge, the students felt incredibly supported. So I think there's a lot to do. It may be take a little more creative thinking, but I, I think that both internally and also connecting with external communities, we can do that. Thank you for the question. Yeah. yeah. There she is. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> I actually have a 
question, but um, but since you called on me, I know I, I, th I thought it was safe to call it on you. <laughs> yeah, so um, I had a conversation earlier today with Kelly Kreitz, and we were talking about um what the future of the humanities is and something. So I was an English major when I was an English literature major when I was an undergrad, and a project I was working on recently made me think about what transformative texts were for me when I was an undergraduate, and I was talking to Kelly about how we might all, all of us in the community at Pace think about what those texts have been for us and thinking about our own foundations in the humanities, some of us as students who were in the liberal arts and undergrad. And so I wondered what one or more of those texts might be for you. Oh, I thought you were going somewhere different, but okay. Um, so I, I love English and history. And in fact, I wasn't able to be a history major for complicated reasons. Um, but uh, when I got the chance to do a second degree, I did become a history major or took a degree in history. But I I mean, for me, works great works of literature and philosophy are still very important to me. One thing that I thought you were going to go to was um, how we might think beyond the traditional Western canon that many of us grew up with and think about what works we might add as we think about humanities in today's world. And I was thinking that I might ask Dean Grimes and her faculty to think about that. And, you know, perhaps even Sean O'Reilly to think about that as we think about, okay, what is the humanities uh, foundation that we should have? But, you know, I mean, I, 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 I will share with you, not that, that anyone really cares, but since you asked, um, I remember um, writing uh, a paper on the cherry orchard by Chekhov, which I find very meaningful for various reasons that we don't need to go into right now. But I thought the, the passing of time and the different generations and, and um, the different class issues and family issues in that play make it a really powerful work for me. But anyway, we can talk later about, about my, my education and my desire to do more. Um, uh, All right, we have some questions uh, via the Q&A. First question comes from Gabe Terizzi. What are the university plans for the summit office? The, the, in Valhalla, the summit office in Valhalla. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I will say that we are looking at our use of space generally. And as, as some of you on this Zoom know, we used to have an office in Midtown Manhattan, for instance, and that was something that we decided we just didn't really need anymore. So I think when we think about places like Valhalla, we want to think about whether that is where our people should be located or if there are places on the three main campuses that they might be better. But, you know, a lot of this looks at various priorities. And, and Joe and I were talking about this today and, um, so I would say that there's an ongoing discussion. Ebiolis is definitely part of that, as well as uh, Bob Allman and Joe Franco and the entire team. Great. I, uh, there's there's no other question. No other. No, there is here. Just oh. make sure there's no oh. live ones. Oh yes, please. President Krizov, um, I'm Maria Cruz Tillery. I'm the associate director of the Counseling Center here on the Westchester campuses. You spoke about um, the increase of recruitment for faculty. And I'm wondering in particular, I was a member of the presidential task force on diversity, equity, inclusion a couple of years ago. So I forget the number that you quoted in terms of how many more faculty have been recruited. Can right. you speak to how many of those belong to um, marginalized um, groups or uh, are they faculty, staff, recruitment of um, people that belong to racial ethnic minority groups and reflect what our what's some of our students uh, um, and the affinity groups that they belong to? Great, thank you for that question. Um, I, I don't know have the numbers on the top of my head. Um, Jean Gallagher or, or um, the provost's office will be able to get back to you shortly. Um, what I will tell you is that what we've really done in the hiring process, and this was done under the former provost, is really worked on having 
um, inclusion be very much part of faculty searches and discussions about how to increase the pool and really reach out more broadly. And I think it has paid off some dividends. I, I don't have the exact numbers. Do I think we're doing enough? Um, maybe not. And, and I think that that's a discussion that we need to have about how to get um, people from diverse backgrounds, including underrepresented from underrepresented groups on our faculty. My sense is that, and, and the last time I looked at the numbers, my sense is that we had made some progress in this, in this regard, um, but we also focus on that in terms of staff recruitment as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's faculty and staff as well as, of course, students. So um, it's front of mine and we work with Stephanie uh, Akunva Bay and, and HR and the provost's office on faculty searches and the deans to make sure that um, the pools are inclusive and the criteria are fair and, uh, and uh, that we do the very best we can to make sure um, that we have a, a representative faculty. So hey, we have another question through the Q&A from Veronica Lorenzo. When it comes to tuition and fees, how do you plan on tackling the high cost given inflation as more and more students continue to apply for student loans? So Rubina Shep is right in front of me and, and she, will be, she will be delighted to talk with you uh, at length, but I, I'm very proud of the work we do uh, Mark Stevens and, and the, the financial aid group. And I think one of the things that we do very well is we really have discussions with families about how to balance loans versus grants versus work study versus, you know, um, uh, payments. And we work with students continually, not just over the summer before they enter, but during their time here. And we've actually expanded our efforts. I think Nicole Thompson has done a really nice job in working with students on thinking about how to use their dollars in the dining halls as well. I mean, it's it's not just the cost, the tuition cost, but sometimes it's some of the uh, the other costs, whether it's it's if you're living on campus or eating on campus as well. Um, we are raising a lot of money for financial aid. We need to do more, um, and that is the highest priority. And Gary Larimer will tell you that that is the area that that is probably the strongest for many of our alums. Um, the President's Scholarship Dinner is coming up in the end of, I think the end of next month. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. If you wanna be invited, call up Gary and, and talk to him about, about scholarships. But um, we try to create packages to, to the question. We try to create packages that are fair to the, the, the student and the family, as well as, as, as acknowledge the, the different challenges we have on our budget, and um, you know, if 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 we could we could raise more money, then of course it would be easier to give aid. I think we try to be very competitive, um, though, in our aid, and try to work with families to make sure they use the money um, effectively. Thank you. March twentieth scholarship dinner. Thank you, Mark. Hey, I have another question. This question is from Barry Bullis. Okay. The greatest factor for student success and retention is the faculty. 63% of all classes and 70% of freshman classes are taught by adjuncts. How will PACE address the huge disparity in pay and benefits of this huge portion of the faculty? Thank you for that question, Barry. I, I expected a question about the adjuncts. And I, as I said in the speech, we, we believe strongly that adjuncts are a very important part of this community and we value them. I know that Provost Franco recently met with the union leadership to talk about that and to indicate our appreciation and indicate that we are um, eager to sit down and begin formal discussions to negotiate a new contract beginning in July of this year. So, and I'm confident that we'll come to a, a fair and equitable agreement. But I do wanna be very clear that we understand the importance of, of adjuncts and uh, we, we intend to, to, to do our best to, to be right by, do right by them. All right, anything else, Susan? Um, I think we maybe have time for one more question. Okay, one more question. Are, are there any in the room? Oh, all right, one more question. 
As this uh, question is from Danielle Fusaro. As we know, boosting our retention is a critical piece of PACE's goals for the upcoming year. Could you speak more, more on the initiative in place to boost retention among our current students? Has there been any talk about streamlining communication across departments and making departments more accessible and easy to connect with for our current students? So I think the provost is very much focused on trying to make sure that the departments do serve the students and he's talked to the department chairs and so forth. I'll say that, that there are ongoing efforts to provide academic support, which we talked about at length in the speech about the learning commons to provide financial aid support, provide, provide mental health and wellness support. Um, and I guess the other thing that I would add to that is that I'm very encouraged by the move to 120 credits. I think that that will also be something that will be very helpful in allowing students to graduate um, on time and, and um, will be a very, a very positive step. It also will be keeping us in line with our peers. And so I'm appreciative to the Dyson faculty for taking the move in that direction. But you know, we are, we are very much um, trying to create and, and the advising, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the advising. Um, the advising is also uh, something that, that really is important. And I teach undecided students and I find that, um, that's an, that, that is a population that really needs a lot of help um, in trying to figure out how to navigate and, and to make some decisions so they can progress with their degree. All right, thank you all for being here. <laughs>